Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Robinson. I'm the publisher of All Books and wanted to welcome you to this All Books Live on Avenue C event. Um, we're going to have these events pretty regularly coming up. Um, so we've got your email addresses now. You'll be hearing from us again. Um, this is a really special one, obviously, because of uh, the speakers that we've got and because of what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, so the two speakers that we've got tonight, um, both are published by All Books. One um, book is yet to come, Aromatic. Uh, uh, the other, Norman Finkelstein, we've published uh, many books over the years by him, and I've published Norman at other publishing companies too. I think um, he's been one of the most singular moral voices on the Israel-Palestine conflict that um, of anyone that I know. Um, he's incredibly well informed. He's a really forensic historian. Um, he's also a passionate supporter of Palestinian rights. His latest book, uh, uh, which is, um, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it, um, has a you know, quite a number of people, Barack Obama, Robin DiAngelo, Kimberly Crenshaw, amongst many others. Um, and Norm does burn bridges, but quite a lot of people are on the side of the river that he's already on. And um, uh, I, I, I think um, the stance that he's taken is over the years has just been magnificent. So we're very pleased to have these two here. Aaron is um, works at the Grey Zone, uh, where he runs a show called Pushback, uh, and he's also co-hosting um, Useful Idiots, a uh, 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 video cast. They're going to talk for about an hour. And then we'll take some questions. So thanks very much. Okay. That was great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Colin Robinson. Thanks to everybody at World Books for organizing this great event. Thank you to our musical act tonight, the Brooklyn Nomads. And thank you for everyone who's here and watching us online. It's great to be here with Norman. Um, I can think of a few people on this earth who have done more to educate us on the realities of the Israel-Palestine issue than Norman Finkelstein, who's been involved for more than 40 years, has written uh, countless articles, many books on this topic, including his latest on the issue is called Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. Norman, I want to just begin with a general question, asking you to talk about one month into this latest Israeli assault on Gaza, uh, we're now talking about the most murderous Israeli assault to date. Um, as we're recording this, the official toll is more than 10,000 Palestinians have been killed, including more than 4,200 children. And that number is more than double the amount of children that have been killed by Israel since 1967. So in just one month, Israel has already killed double the number of Palestinian children that it killed since 1967. So, Norman, and the hard part about these, saying these figures is by the time you say them, they're already outdated because this massacre is unfolding in real time. So, Norman, let me just begin by asking you your assessment of Israel's assault one month in, what you think their goals are, if they really have any, beyond just extermination, and do you think the term genocide is appropriate? Well, thank you for having me. I was surprised when I realized today it was one month uh, since the Israeli assault began. It feels like it's just been one long, continuous day with occasional breaks. And I have to say on a totally self-indulgent note, I feel completely depleted at this point. I just try to keep two things in mind. Number one, my depletion 
pales to a, in a ridiculous comparison to the people of Gaza who for one month have had to endure uninterrupted terror bombing on a scale probably not ever experienced anywhere on this planet ever. And the second thing which gives me a certain amount of, let's just say, inspiration is I, every once in a while, pick up the letters of Rosa Luxemburg. And some of you might know that she spent most of World War I in jail. And even though she tried to lift her own spirits, it must have been a very difficult ordeal because by nature she was a gregarious personality. And just as she was released three years after her imprisonment, she came out and uh, her friends observed later that she came out and her hair in jail had turned completely white. And people were quite shocked at how, how seriously she had physically deteriorated in jail. And yet, she literally, literally did not miss a beat. She went right from the jail into, and this sounds like a movie script, but it really is not. She went right from the jail into the street and thus began for her or her wing of the German Social Democratic Party Thus began the German Revolution, and it ended for her with her being beaten so badly that one woman who observed it said, I have never in my life, never in my life, seen a person brutalize the way she was. And it reminded me that all well, those were great people in great times, but it also humbled me. Norm, you've got it good. Find the energy, we move on. So where do we stand now? Um, some things are, I think, pretty clear. One is that Israel is now using or exploiting the opportunity of October 7th to do things which it has not done before. The tactics Israel is you are you the tactics Israel is using are obviously not new terror bombing, targeting hospitals, targeting civilians, targeting civilian infrastructure, pulverizing homes. Anybody who has even just scratched the surface of Israel's periodic mowing of the lawns in Gaza will know that these tactics are the stock and trade of that state. However, it's clearly occurring on a not just quantitatively, but a qualitatively different scale. And then one has to assess what are its goals. The first goal, it seems to me, is 
pretty transparent. It's a kind of morbid bloodlust, the need to revenge the fact that the Untermeschen have risen up and it's such the case of these Ubermenschen, the supermen, with all their arrogance, they now have to put the subhumans, the Untermenschen, in their place, not least because they displayed a degree of cleverness and ingenuity which doesn't befit an Arab. So I think one shouldn't underestimate the extent to which there is that, com that component of sheer bloodlust to, to teach them a lesson not to lift their head. The second component of the current assault has some overlap with the first component, and that's what the Israelis call restoring the deterrence capacity. And deterrence capacity is just a fancy term, technical term, for restoring the Arab world's fear of Israel, which took a huge blow on October 7th. Because if there's any aspect of the Israeli military, which uh, is its trademark, it's been its intelligence capacity, its commando raids, the kind of high-tech ingenuity that one normally associates with this ubermenschen state. And yet, in a, in a um, uh, in a, a uh, kind of cleverness that's kind of hard to conceive. Gaza, as everybody in this room knows, it's a tiny parcel of land. And it was the most heavily surveilled parcel of land on God's earth. And it was being surveilled by the most sophisticated surveillance technology known to humankind. And in Gaza, everybody is related to everybody else. So, what we do know, and a lot of what happened on October 7th remains quite murky, but what we do know is that, at least according to Hamas, and here I'm willing to give them, I'll, I'll grant some credibility to their, to their statements. Usually their statements need to be corroborated. But I would say here it's probably true that they planned this operation for two years. Now, about 1,500 Hamas fighters burst through the gates of Gaza on October 7th. About 240 Israelis were taken hostage. So that would bring the number up, if you assume for each hostage there were roughly two fighters, that would bring up the number to about 2,000 Hamas militants burst through the gates. So that means that for about two years, this operation 
have been pled, presumably they tested it in advance in various forms. And yet, if you know Arab society, and I suspect some people in this room are of Arab descent, when, uh, so, uh, when a relative comes visiting, you can't say, I'm busy. You have to open the door, then begins the protocol, the ritual with the coffee, the tea, and so forth. So there's a huge amount of interaction going on there in a very small space. And then there's the other element, which they call the technical term is human int, human intelligence. There are a huge number of collaborators in Gaza, the former uh, employees of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So that's another element in their secure in the intelligence available to Israel. And yet they managed to plan this operation for two years with at least 2,000 fighters involved. And it escaped the notice, it eluded the Israeli intelligence. And so for Israel, this was such a shattering blow. Even yesterday, I was talking to my closest and oldest friend in the West Bank, Musa Abu Heshesh, and he commented exactly what um, I, I deduced before talking to him. Uh, he said to me, everybody in the Arab world, suddenly it, it dawned on them, Israel is not that strong. This is a rinky-dink army, Hamas. And this rinky-dink army in this totally impoverished, technically primitive corner of the world, managed to pull this off. And that's what Israel fears most, namely its deterrence capacity, the Arab world's fear of it, suffered a de devastating blow on October 7th. And now one of their goals of the current round of the current massacre is to restore the deterrence capacity to remind the Arab world that don't mess with us because we'll do to you what we're now doing to Gaza. Now, well, let me quote something for you. Yeah. This is from your book, Gaza and Inquest to its Martyrdom. And you point out that this uh, goal of uh, sowing fear in Israel's foes and its so-called deterrence capacity has been driving Israel for decades. So, for example, you quote Ariel Sharon in 1967. At the time, he's a divisional military commander. He goes on to become the prime minister. And he voiced concern in 67 that Israel was losing its, quote, deterrence capability, our main weapons, the fear of us. Yes, and that, that, that concern the part of Israel has been reiterated uh, many times in the past month. And the third component is, in many ways, even though the first two are in and of themselves uh, very destructive of the life of the people in Gaza, the third component is Israel is going to use this occasion where it seems to have the technical term they always use is a casus belli, namely a legitimate ground, military grounds, namely what happened October 7th. And that is uh, to use that sinister but wholly um, relevant language, in my opinion, they're going to use this occasion to finally solve the Gaza question. And the solution 
if we can use the expression, the final solution they have in mind still remains somewhat murky because I don't think the Israelis themselves have decided or have figured out what is the maximum they can extract at this moment or the maximum they can extract by exploiting what happened on October 7th. And there are various possibilities. It's quite clear now that their first hope was to force a significant portion and maybe the whole of the Palestinian population into the Egyptian Sinai. And they seemed to believe they had realistic prospects of that. Number one, the Egyptian economy is going through a very rough period now, and there were offers made to uh, the head of state, Sisi, to give him a large amount of money if he would take the Gazans into the Sinai. A second aspect was that Prime Minister Netanyahu was actively lobbying in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to forgive the loans by Egypt. Right now, half of Egypt's revenue is servicing debt. So to forgive the loans, if they would take the Arabs or Gazans into the Sinai. Um, unfortunately for Israel, that didn't work out. CC drew a red line on that and said, we're not taking, we're not taking over your Gaza problem. That's your problem, and you're going to have to figure out what to do. Now that's as of now. I can't predict whether there will be a change of heart on his part in another month or two months from now. So that was one of their goals. I think their hope was by emptying out the northern sector of Gaza. Gaza is already among the most densely populated places on God's earth and then you would double the density in the south, um, and then some gate has to open. It would become, in the most literal sense, unlivable. Short of that goal, it's quite clear, and the Israelis uh, are not making any secret of it, is to simply totally demolish Gazan society, completely leveling it, turning it into effectively a cross between a garbage dump and a parking lot. It's already half of the civilian homes, dwellings, have been destroyed or severely damaged. Which, and there have been entire neighborhoods which have disappeared. And the bottom line is there will be nothing to go back to. There will not even be any recognize in the most literal sense, there will be nothing recognizable of where you lived. It will simply have been pulverized. Uh, and I think that will then maybe convince a large number of Palestinians not to go back because there's nothing to go back to. Um, so I think that's uh, 
where things stand. I'm not a military expert, and I say that with a great deal of pride. Uh, I'm not a military expert. I would say at the military level, it does look very grim. Uh, however well Hamas prepared for the Israeli ground invasion, uh, it has taken such a pummeling is not the right word, such a devastation. It's hard to even guess how many fighters are still alive in the tunnels they built. And it's simply unrealistic. Here I think I can say it without having military knowledge. It's unrealistic that they can militarily prevail over Israel. There has been some talk in Israel about simply dividing Gaza in two, then cutting off the tunnels at one end and just waiting it out until the fighters run out of food, run out of water, and then surface and get killed. And the captives die because Netanyahu doesn't care about them. Um, let me ask you, Norman, about then the- I just want to yeah. add one last thing. One critical variable, apart from international pressure, which doesn't seem like it's going to work. The only possibility I see in terms of international pressure is um, Israel already uh, or I should say, the Biden administration already allowed one large-scale massacre, a single blow massacre, namely at the Arab National, what's called Baptist Hospital. Israel, the United States gave them a pass on that. And Jabalia as well. Uh, well, I would say Jabalia didn't quite get the headlines that the hospital did. Um, but if you go back, for example, to, and this is going to be way past most of you in the room, if you go back to the June 1982 invasion of Lebanon, what finally ended it was the Sabra and Shatila massacres in September 1982. The war began in June. It went on for uh, June, July. Yeah, it went on for three and a half months. Um, what finally ended it was the Sagra and Shatila massacres, uh, which leads me to conclude if Israel commits a fantastic massacre, it may come under the international pressure forcing it to at least accept a ceasefire. Now, I did read as I was coming here today that Israel has declared that it's going after Al-Shifa Hospital. Al-Shifa is the main hospital in Gaza. And if they do it by air, right now it seems like they won't be doing it by air, but if they do it by air and simply kill thousands of patients in the hospital, I think that will cause the Biden administration some political problems. But short of that, it doesn't look as if they can be stopped at the level of international pressure. And then there's one other possibility. There's Hamas prevailing in a military contest. I don't, see, I don't believe that's possible. There's international pressure. I don't think that will kick in unless Israel commits a second huge massacre and the Biden administration decides we can't give a second pass. And the third possibility is, of course, the regional one. And that's what I want to ask you about. Yeah. So as we're speaking, the leader of Hezbollah, Nasrallah, gave a speech a few days ago. I'm curious your impressions from that speech. It was interpreted very differently by many people. The main takeaway I heard from him is he said, correct me if I'm wrong, he said that we will not let Hamas lose 
What does that mean? And what did you take away from his speech? Well, I should note that he's giving another speech on Saturday, uh, which merits attention. Uh, so this fellow is very serious, very smart, and usually a person of his word. I, as many of my friends and comrades, we anxiously awaited the first speech and people were very disappointed. I was looking for a miracle and the speech confirmed that miracles don't happen. Uh, he is plainly in an impossible situation because if they do anything significant, Israel's Air Force will level Lebanon, and that will turn the whole Lebanese population against Hezbollah. And then there is the other question whether Iran would support uh, opening up the second front, because you will recall just before October 7th, there was that exchange of money for hostages, and Iran was hoping for some sort of rapprochement with the United States. So it's very unlikely that they want to risk uh, a regional war. On the other hand, as Aaron correctly pointed out, most of Nasrallah's speech was given over to talking about everything Hezbollah had already done, namely it fired some rockets, about, he said, about half the Israeli Navy, about a quarter of the Air Force were now on the Northern Front. So he's saying we're giving breathing room to Hamas. But he did say at the end, we will not let Hamas lose. And I would say, if he said it, he is a person of his word, and beyond being a person of his word, it's the credibility of his organization that's going to be at stake, because the whole reputation of Hezbollah is, we don't just talk, we act. And if he said that, um, there's probably substance to it, as I've said in the course of a lot of correspondence this past week, I don't know if I wish more that he does open a second front or that he doesn't open a second front. If he does open a second front, that will be a salve for the people of Gaza. But if he does, if he, if, if he does open, if he doesn't open the second, okay, if he doesn't open the second front, it's a disaster for Gaza. If he does open the second front, all bets are off. It could so rapidly deteriorate into something which nobody wants to imagine. And we do have to bear in mind that Israel does have those nuclear weapons. And if a second front is open, and the, I don't know how much value to attach to it, but they say uh, Hamas's rocket and missile stockpile goes up to about 150,000 projectiles. And if they start heading towards Tel Aviv, then. Has bullets. Hezbollah, what did I say? Yeah, Hezbollah, yeah. it's about 150,000. If they start targeting Tel Aviv, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's a very, it's a very tough moment now. You mentioned earlier that the, the Biden administration has not acted, has not imposed any constraints at all on Israel, even though it even though it supplies the critical uh, military support and diplomatic cover. The only pressure I've seen so far that's been reported is that it, 
the Biden administration has reportedly asked Israel to use smaller bombs on Gaza, pointing out that the bombs that they've given them are not meant to be used for these densely populated environments. So that's the one concrete step that Biden's taken, is asking Israel to use smaller bombs. And the second one is this, is this tepid call, which initially the Biden administration opposed, but they're now embracing, which is a, hu a so-called humanitarian pause. And Bernie Sanders has endorsed that as well. Not a ceasefire, but humanitarian pause. Can you comment on that term? Well, uh, first of all, if you listen to Nasrallah's speech, it was quite interesting that he didn't really focus that much on Israel. The largest part of the speech by far was to describe what's going on as a U.S. war. And that was very striking to me because there's a tendency in the Arab Muslim world, as well as among elements on the left, to focus or hyper-focus on the Israeli element to the exclusion of the American element. And I know that Nasrallah has met with Professor Chomsky on occasion, and it was striking to me that he had kind of internalized or accepted the Chomsky conception that the evildoer is not located in Jerusalem, the evildoer is located in the United States. And Chomsky encouraged him to try to reach U.S. public opinion, right? That was one of his words of advice to us. Well, that wouldn't have been a particularly wise piece of advice. The, uh, the likelihood of re uh, Syed Nasrallah reaching American public opinion, I would say, is the likely, about roughly the same as the likelihood that I'll get a tenure track job at this, <laughs> at this point in my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, in any event, uh, for all of the theatrics, I think there are two points. Number one, what happened on October 7th was a disaster for the United States as well. Israel is the pillar of the U.S. policy in the Middle East. And the expectation was, for example, that Saudi Arabia would enter into alliance with the U.S., and that the U.S. and Israel would be there should there be a conflict between, say, the Saudis and Iranians. Well, October 7th was a wake-up call for the Saudis, namely, well, how much, just how much should we be investing in Israel, pulling our chestnuts out of the fire if there's a conflict with Iran. So the U.S. was as committed from the point of view of its own interests, the U.S. was as committed and is as committed to restoring Israel's deterrence capacity. Now, all of this talk about Anthony Blinken wanting a humanitarian pause, and the Israelis saying no, is totally ridiculous. It's absurd. Israel suffered such a blow on October 7th. The United States sent two aircraft carriers in the region. Biden promised them another 18 billion or 14 billion dollars and you're telling me that Biden couldn't say to the Israelis humanitarian pause now Israel wasn't in a position to say no it's just theatric so the US can pretend that it's sensitive to the humanitarian issue, and Prime Minister Netanyahu can pretend that he's a strong man standing up to the United States. 
In this particular instance, what the U.S. says goes. And if they don't, if there isn't a humanitarian pause, let alone a ceasefire, that's because that's what the U.S. wants. Now, it can be argued that Biden's, um, Biden's concerns are twofold. One, restoring the deterrence capacity of the pillar of our policy, our military posture in the Middle East. And two, I do think there's an issue of those uh, Jewish donors and uh, the Jewish building their money for the election. I think part of it was a photo op with the election uh, in mind. And one of the revealing things about what's happened the last month is to watch how that billionaire money works. So, um, if I can, you'll forgive my indulgence for a moment, but it is pertinent. When I was denied tenure in 2007, it was pretty obvious to me that Paul is a big university, it's the major real estate developer in Chicago, there are people on the board of trustees. They don't want me there. And they just say to the president, well, you know, I hear this guy Finkelstein is coming up for tenure. He's not going to get tenure, is he? And that's how it works. That's how it used to work. It's all done behind the scenes. And it's all done with an element of subtlety. But this past month has been quite extraordinary. Because if you watch what's going on in the college campuses, the Jewish billionaire class is just very forthright. And the numbers are staggering, at least from my point of view in Ocean Parkway, in Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, one billionaire says, if you don't condemn what happened on October 7th, I'm taking back $100 million. I'm sure Colin appreciates, now that he shows me his new office, $100 <laughs> million is money. Another one says at the Wharton School, you don't condemn, Wharton School is from the U University of Pennsylvania, you don't condemn what happened, we're taking back $50 million. And there is no, as I said, no behind the scenes maneuvering. This is in your face. And now you multiply that number by tenfold or a hundredfold. And that's the kind of money you're talking about in the presidential election. So there's been, uh, for Biden, I'm quite certain that was a consideration when he went over and hugged uh, the teary-eyed uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and then all the cameras flashed for the money, for the, uh, <laughs> for the donors, for the donors. But I would not say, I would say that is an element, and one should not, one should not trivialize that element as we now see as it's being played out in our major and elite universities, it's a significant element. Uh, but I don't think it's the main one. The main one was the collapse of the, one of the pillars of US policy in the region. I'll just say an, an amusing note, not amusing, nothing's amusing about this thing, but it's an ironic note what happened in the college campuses was, in the current woke climate, all of the colleges had to take a stand on uh, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter. So they all took the stand condemning racism and wasn't it horrible what happened to George Floyd, blah, 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 blah. So then it came along the Ukraine war and the cultural institutions start to take a stand on that. 
So if you went, for example, to Lincoln Center, there was a wall just covered with pictures of musicians attached to Lincoln Center who were of Ukrainian descent. So now along comes the Jewish billionaire class and with a certain amount of legitimacy. legitimacy they said, if you condemn George Floyd and you condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine, then why aren't you condemning what happened on October 7th? And one has to acknowledge there is a certain amount of consistency to that. But then the problem arose. They were told, condemn or else. Very clear. Condemn or else, we're taking back our money. But then the problem arose. OK. You condemned what happened on October 7, but then what about what happened in October 8, 9, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, and so forth in Gaza? So now the university presidents are presented with what you might be called being caught between a rock and a hard place. If we don't condemn what happened on October 7th, they take back the money. But if we condemn what happened on the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, they're going to take back the money anyway. So what do you do? Well, that's one good reason not to become a college president. <laughs> I want to ask you about Hamas. Um, and I want to ask you about your assessment of them from the point of view of serving the interests of Palestinian liberation. Um, do you think it's too early to judge just from that sole metric, whether October 7th served that cause or undermined it. And let me put you some of the criticisms of them around this, that they launched this operation without the consent of their population, who are now bearing the brunt of it. And they built up, you know, just putting some more of the critiques that have been lodged against them, they've built up this vast tunnel infrastructure where they can hide, but they didn't build bomb shelters for their own population. Okay, I'm going to take those two questions. Obviously, I'll have to take them separately, discreetly. The first question is, and it came up from day one, even if you're sympathetic to the breakout from Gaza concentration camp, even if you're sympathetic to that, and even if you're willing to overlook atrocities which almost certainly happened. The scale, I can't say at this point. The exact nature, I can't say at this point. However, I do think it's reasonable to conclude that atrocities of a significant magnitude occurred, but I won't go beyond that. Even if you're willing to look past that, the question then arises, what good came of it? What good came of it? Is the total destruction of Gaza, was it worth it? Was it wise? Was it prudent? Um, and I take it that's the question that Aaron is asking me. And here I have a couple of responses. I will acknowledge none of them is completely satisfactory. Um, my first response would be, and I'm not going to be defensive about it. As I've said in the course of the past few weeks and also in the course of my entire adult life, uh, I don't think if you consider yourself a radical, a revolutionary, or just believe in the principle of justice, I don't think we should ever shy away from truth. That it has always been a belief among those who have sought a better world, and that includes the left, but not exclusively the left, 
that there is no contradiction between truth and justice. Those two concepts, truth and justice, have eternally gone hand in hand. So I, at any rate, do not fear the truth, and I'm not going to be defensive about it at this moment and in response to that question. So I'm going to just use an analogy in trying to answer that question. Recently, I've begun at the very end of my life to start rereading and studying American history. I remember I used to work in a inner city after school program in this area, not right here, but roughly. Uh, it's called the Hudson Guild in 10th Avenue and 26th Street in Manhattan at the public housing projects. And I was a raving, flaming Maoist at the time. And some of my co-workers who didn't quite share my fervor, but also believed in justice, would, kind, would gently suggest to me, Norm, don't you think you should be studying, studying something a little closer to home than China if you want to change the world? Of course, there was a certain amount of wisdom there. In any event, so now I'm reading American history, and I'll just give you one example. So there's this fellow named Nat Turner, very smart guy. By everybody's reckoning at the time, first of all, the guy had a prodigious knowledge of the Bible, was highly literate, and part of his rage came from the fact that he was so gifted by nature or by God, and yet all he had to look forward to in life was being a slave. And it was that rage that uh, uh, sprang from the chasm that separated his prodigious gifts on the one hand and his unlucky fate to be born a slave on the other. At some point, he organizes a slave revolt, and the slave revolt was pretty a pretty gory affair. He gives the order to his troop, kill all white people. And did they ever they burst into homes and beheaded babies. They went, as it were, berserk. <clears throat> okay? They killed about 60 people, 60 white people. In retaliation, they did what Israel is doing now. The white folks randomly caught black people cut off their heads and put them on spears and then along the road to remind black people, you go into revolt, this is what's going to happen to you. They killed about 120 black people and then about 80 more were uh, executed after trials in quotation marks. So, that was completely crazy. At that point, the South started to pass all these laws, including because Nat Turner was hyper-literate, they passed the law that said, you can't teach a slave to read. It came after the Nat Turner revolt. I was surprised at that. I thought it had come earlier, but it was a result of the Nat Turner revolt. They passed that law. And then comes in 1859, John Brown's attempt at an insurrection. Now, John Brown 
was like Nat Turner, a complete religious fanatic, so fanatical that he was possessed of the idea that slavery was such a blasphemy, such a crime against God, that he gave over his whole being, as young people would say, 24-7, 365, to abolishing slavery. Even there's an interesting reminiscence by Frederick Douglass. He says he comes, he spent Frederick Douglass, the black abolitionist, he spent a lot of time with Nat Turner, and Nat Turner was talking about hit the plan for the constitution of the new state that he's going to create, and this plan, and that plan, and Frederick Douglass frankly admits at one point, you know, this guy is beginning to bore me. He is so obsessed, so fanatical. Now, in Potawatomi, during what was called Bloody Kansas, Nat Turner took hostages. John Brown. John Brown took hostages. And as W.E.B. Du Bois describes it in his biography of John Brown, he says, quote, John Brown hacked those hostages to pieces. So, and then two years later, there's the Civil War. Now, if you just look discreetly at Nat Turner, it looks totally crazy. The guy was bonkers. He gives the order to kill all whites, and it results in this very ugly reaction, which was a escalated repression. Yet, John Brown says, I was inspired by Nat Turner. And then Frederick Douglass, in his famous eulogy to John Brown says, at the very end of the eulogy, he says, it is not true that John Brown failed. He said, and he kept saying it emphatically, it's not true. He said there is a direct line from John Brown to the Civil War. And John Brown says there's a direct line from Nat Turner to me. And it's a case of links in a chain. And it's a very strange outcome. So I'm going to ask you, Norman, to make your way back to Hamas. Make the yeah. line back to Hamas. Okay. okay. No. Uh, I do think you have to think these things through. I can't predict what's going to happen as a result of Hamas's action on October 7th. I don't think anyone in this room can predict it. I think these are links in a chain. Now, you might not like this particular link because it's too bloody and too many atrocities occur in that link. But here's the irony. The irony is that John Brown, who was executed for his acts of treason when he seized an armory, within two years of his execution and his execration by the whole of our society, including the abolitionists, the abolitionists did not like John Brown, including the abolitionists, within two years, our Union Army was singing, I know Colin is going to say, Norman, keep your day job. <laughs> John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. 
Charlie Brown's body winds up within two years of the acts of treason for which he was uh, executed. And now, now, I described what Nat Turner did, I'm confident, very accurately. Now, Nat Turner occupies a respected place in American history. So, the crazy Nat Turner, with his apparently utterly destructive act, which had no redeeming feature, he's now a link in the chain. Towards, and I'll just make one other analogy. People say, why did Hamas do it? All that resulted was the death, the destruction. It was stupid. It was this, it was that, so on and so forth. Okay? So, you'll... If, if it's a long analogy, we don't have time for it. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> no, it'll be very quick. So, in April 19, 1943, the Jews in Warsaw, they engage in an uprising. And for Jews, that's considered a heroic chapter in the modern history of America, of world Jewry. What did it accomplish? You know what it accomplished? It catalyzed the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. Once they engaged in the insurrection, the Nazis went in and they leveled the ghetto. So if you use the calculus of, or the utilitarian calculus of what did it accomplish, by that calculus, you can make the same argument. Well, what did the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising accomplish? So I'm reluctant to use those kinds of calculations. I think that as a moral fact, that it is impossible to condemn either what Nat Turner did, and the abolitionists would not condemn Nat Turner. And it's impossible to condemn what the people of Gaza did after having been not just incarcerated in a concentration camp, but having been born into that concentration camp. I do not believe it is morally tenable to condemn them, even as one can acknowledge, as William Lloyd Garrison did in the case of Nat Turner, that horrifying atrocities occurred. Now, some of you might say there's a contradiction there. If you acknowledge its atrocities, then you must condemn the perpetrators of those atrocities. But I would say life is sometimes more complicated than applying categories in a uniform, consistent way. We're going to take questions very shortly, very shortly. Um, I just have one more for Norman, and I'll ask you to be as brief as possible so we can get to questions. There's a term that you've cited a lot in your work, um, going back to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which is, it comes from an Israeli military analyst, and it, the phrase is, uh, Israel's intent to thwart a Palestinian peace offensive. And that was the goal, the, the actual goal of Israel's invasion of Lebanon, that the PLO was accepting the international consensus of a two-state solution. And so Israel, under the pretext of trying to prevent a security threat that didn't actually exist, went to war in Lebanon to destroy the PLO because they had to thwart, in the words of this Israeli analyst, the Palestinian peace offensive. And you pointed out that that applies to Hamas as well, with Israel's periodic massacres in Gaza, that uh, Hamas, ever since it was uh, elected in the mid-2000s, has moderated its position. It's basically accepted the global consensus of a Palestinian state within the 67 borders. And Israel has periodically broken ceasefires and gone and committed these atrocities to undermine that and actually provoke Hamas attacks. Um, 
And then we have to mention also that there was the Great March of Return in 2018, which Hamas wasn't responsible for, but they certainly let happen. That was a peaceful, nonviolent uprising in, in which Gazans were marching for their rights, doing what the world was asking them to do. And they were gunned down by Israel with U.S. weapons. And the world, including those of us here in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, just kind of watched it. We didn't do much. I remember at the time you were very vocal about the need for protests here in Solidarity, and they weren't. They weren't happening. So mindful of all that background, that when Palestinians try to be nonviolent, they uh, accept the global consensus of a two-state solution. The Arab states have put forward for many years uh, this the so-called Arab peace, in, peace initiative offering Israel full peace in return for a Palestinian state within 22% of historic Palestine, which is a big compromise for Palestinians. Mindful of all that, do you think Hamas did enough in, in pursuing um, that track of where they were going initially uh, of accepting a Palestinian state within the six, seven borders? Um, the, the question that Aaron asks can but be con related to the current stance of the senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, who is currently, as we speak, being celebrated by APEC. Yeah. That's not an exaggeration, that's a fact. Um, so, Bernie Sanders said two things. One, given the scale of the atrocities that Hamas committed, it's impossible to negotiate with them and they have to be eliminated. And two, that Hamas wants to destroy Israel and therefore it has to be eliminated. And it's on those two grounds that he says he opposes a ceasefire. So let's look at those two claims. Number one, Hamas couldn't even remotely approach the scale, the magnitude of the massacres Israel has repeatedly inflicted on Gaza, leaving aside the incarceration of the people of Gaza in a concentration camp which Richard Goldstone described as a crime against humanity, that concentration camp. And so the question obviously begs for an answer. If Hamas's crime on October 7th disqualified it from being a participant in any negotiated settlement, and it had to be destroyed. Why doesn't the Israeli state have to be destroyed after committing massacres on a exponentially greater scale against the people of Gaza? Number two, the record clearly shows that beginning in 2006, when Hamas won the parliamentary elections, that it was making serious attempts to achieve one of two things. One, and I always forget the Arabic term, somebody here might be able to assist me. One is a 30 year long ceasefire. A hudna. Oh, I didn't know Arab was Arab. Um, a hudna. Uh, a 30 year ceasefire with Israel, or at other moments, they put forth a, um, a, uh, a terms for a settlement which matched the international consensus, two states, 67 border, and so on and so forth, everything done. Uh, Israel rejected all of that, and Hamas gave up on it. I think we should not I know in this current 
woke moment, we're always supposed to talk about the agency of the oppressed. In most situations, the agency of the oppressed, in this case, the people of Gaza, is very marginal. So, but Norman, okay, let me just the get... The people of Gaza, I, I mean... Or let I'm me not trying to argue with you, but, but I, I do yeah. know that the people of Gaza are not the leadership of Hamas. That's a fair point to make, I think. Uh, it depends on what aspect you're addressing. In certain aspects, it seems Hamas has become quite corrupt and has alienated the population of Gaza. On the other hand, it doesn't seem that there is large-scale uh, opposition to what Hamas did on October 7th. And I'm willing to acknowledge that, that people saw it as a heroic act, uh, breaking free from that prison. For those of you who don't like to hear that or think I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying, I will, with, with uh, hope Aaron will forgive me, it's exactly analogous to the African-American reaction to Nat Turner. You couldn't find an African-American who was going to condemn Nat Turner. So there are moments where there is overlap and there are moments where there is, you have to discriminate between the Hamas leadership and the population of Gaza. Now, given that that attempt to reach an agreement with Israel was going nowhere, the next logical attempt would be at some nonviolent civil disobedience. And that's what the Palestinians in Gaza attempted in Mar beginning March 30th, 2018. And I will say, I was, one, I'm not proud of this, I was one of the people who encouraged that strategy. I was in touch with some people in Hamas and I was very optimistic about it. And that very quickly degenerated into a complete catastrophe because nonviolent resistance can't work if there is no bystanders willing to take a stand against it. If you are, for example, in some rainforest in India where the Naxalites are and the government comes in it's not a wise thing to try nonviolence. You're just going to be mowed down. Nonviolence, for example, in our own country, was contingent on the reaction it evoked in the North and around the world. In the absence of that reaction, the nonviolence would have failed in a week they would have just been brutally defeated. Still so the Farmer Michael talks about that, that uh, organizing in the South of you know, they attack the gun, nonviolence doesn't work. Well, I don't agree with that part, but I'll be happy to discuss it with you. I don't agree with that part uh, because I do think it worked in the American South. It was a brilliant, a brilliant practical example of the possibilities of nonviolence, but those possibilities are in very narrow circumstances. As a general rule, it can't work unless it resonates with a broader population outside the actual perpetrators of violence. You're not going to convert the American South to the rights of black people. It had to be imposed from without. And the Palestinians tried the nonviolence, the Great March of Return in March 30th, and the international community was indifferent. And so what happened? Well, we know exactly what happened. 
Israel, according to the human rights organ uh, publications, and now I'm quoting them, they targeted children, nonviolent children, they targeted medics, they targeted journalists, and they targeted Gazans with physical disabilities. They were targeting people in wheelchairs, people on crutches, who were marching towards the perimeter of the concentration camp. And it was not unsurprising than the face of that heartless, merciless brutality, the nonviolence wouldn't work. And so I don't believe that the people of Gaza had any options left. In fact, and I've said this on numerous occasions, so you'll forgive me for repeating myself, I myself in 2020 had given up. I stopped writing on the topic. I didn't write anything for three years after 2020. Uh, I wrote one book after the Gaza book called I Accuse, and it was at such a level of micro detail, uh, it sold very poorly. I remember when Colin Robinson came to me and he said, you know, Norm, uh, that sold only 374 copies. And that was painful. It was painful because, you know, Colin, it's a small outfit and selling just 374 copies, half of which I purchased myself. <laughs> you know, it's true because I was sending it to the International Criminal Court. <laughs> Don't sell it at the back. <laughs> Uh, I think it's called the main dirt. Uh, and I was, I was writing in more and more micro detail until it suddenly dawned on me, what am I doing? Nobody's interested anymore. The cause is dead. And um, as most of you will recall, for the last three years, all the talk was about the normalization between Israel and uh Bar, uh, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and then now Saudi Arabia, um, the cause looked dead. And the people of Gaza were going to be left to languish and die in that concentration camp into which they had been born uh, when the blockade started in 2006. So for any of you or anyone listening who wants to condemn them, I ask the same question as I did when Russia attacked Ukraine in February of 2021. 2021? Yeah, two. Yeah. Yeah. What were the options? What were the alternatives? Now, I will admit, part of me, I, I, like a movie, you keep going over the real in your mind. Okay, let's say they broke out of Gaza prison, Gaza concentration camp, and just fled. Just broke out and fled. Well, what would have happened? It's very easy to predict what would have happened. Because a couple of years ago, Three Palestinians with enormous, again, that ingenuity, they managed to break out of a prison, a high security prison in Israel. When they broke out of the prison, there was a kind of euphoria among the Palestinian population. They escaped. They figured out how to escape. They escaped. They had been digging the tunnel with their hands for years. And they finally broke free. And then what happened? Within 24 hours, they were all trapped down and dead. And that just shattered the spirits of the people of Palestine. It was like, nothing can work. We're doomed. So if they had just broken free and escaped, 
with absolute certainty, every single one of them would have been tracked down and killed. So then what were they supposed to do? They chose to take hostages. That was their modus operandi. Now, there are many people here who will condemn that. But then I still have to put the question, what option was available to them except to languish and die in Gaza concentration camp? Okay, Norman, thank you for that. Let's take some questions. Uh, you, sir, at the very back. You look familiar, too. Yeah, you, you as well. Uh, uh, it's my brother, Daniel. Yeah. I have two questions for you, Norman. You can take which one you like, or feel so moved to answer them both. One is probably skins with the other. I'm wondering how much credence you put in something that you're writing me about, which is some sort of long game, uh, ulterior motive, there's some kind of offshore oil, uh, uh, opportunities for Israel and the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, just as opposed to Gaza, and that this, this is somehow uh, you know, aimed at that in the, in the, in the long term. Number two, I'm curious, that recent event, I remember when Amnesty International was at Selling, officially declared Israel an apartheid state. We were able to see. You amended your long-standing opposition to capital B, capital B, capital S, tactically, to say, or at least you seemed to soften them in some respect. Have, in light of recent events, without relitigating all of that, what do you, do you think that some sort of international boycott, divestment, sanction movement, the chance, the prospects, and the wisdom of that has been sort of resurrected by Okay, so I'll just summarize for our video audience. Two questions. To what extent, if any, are gas interests at play here in terms of uh, regional geopolitical interest? Gaza has gas reserves, and there's, there's been talk about uh, this being some sort of play in the long term for Israel to take full control of those gas reserves. And the second question is, you've been critical in the past, Norman, of, of the tactic of BDS, in that its refusal to accept the international consensus of a two-state solution, and in light of both uh, human rights groups declaring that Israel is an apartheid state and this current atrocity, have you amended your your critiques of, of BDS as a tactic? Girl? The answer to the first question is, in my mind, straightforward. There's no evidence that that element of the gas reserves off of Gaza played a role either in October 7th or in the current calculations of the Israeli government. My it skills them anyway, right? It, yeah, yeah, they weren't that, wasn't a, that was not an issue. Yeah. Um, the response to the second question, uh, it would be utterly absurd for anybody to oppose the tactics of boycott, divestment, and sanctions those are tried and true tactics of any solidarity movement. Uh, there were elements of, however, BDS as a formal organization, which I found unacceptable, or at least I found problematic. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now, because I feel that's beating a dead horse. But I would say, just as a political question, I think often people confuse a party program or a, uh, a party uh, ideology, philosophy, whatever you want to call it. They confuse that with politics. And the two are very different. In the course of the last year, while I was trying to make sense of the Ukraine war, I got to rereading Leon Trotsky. And uh, there's a collection of Trotsky's works on the Spanish, uh, the Span what he was called the Spanish Revolution in the 1930s. And Trotsky's followers were very small in number and very untested in politics. And what was very striking when you read his writings is he makes a point that one of the most difficult aspects of politics 
is getting the right slogan at a particular moment. Because the political forces are constantly in flux. The consciousness, and we can use those old fashioned terms, the consciousness of the masses is always in flux. And the, the challenge of coming up with the right political slogan at a particular political moment is one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenges facing any political movement. So say, having said that, right now, it seems obvious to me, it seems obvious to me that the right slogan for this political moment is one, ceasefire now. Two, lift the blockade of Gaza. And three, and stop the ethnic cleansing in the West Bank. Because there is a very real possibility that Israel will use this occasion not only to solve the Gaza question, but to solve the West Bank question with a major expulsion. So, with that in mind, I have attended several of the demonstrations that have come to pass. I have to say they were hugely inspiring, utterly magnificent, totally thrilling. But with all of that, and I will not in any way, any way, dilute my praise of what the young people, and dare it be said, the young Jewish people, have been doing in the past month, I do not believe the slogan, it's true it rhymes, Palestine will be, or from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Yes. I think I'm going to have trouble. <laughs> I, I do not think that is a wise slogan now. That may be your aspiration. It may be part of your political program. It may be part of your ideology. But political slogans are something else. And when you start conflating them, I think you lose people who you can potentially win over on trying to achieve a particular goal at a particular moment, given the current balance of political forces and the current consciousness of, to use that hackneyed expression, of the masses. And I think that young people, and I understand the tendency towards pu uh, purity, I get that. I was there. When I was the age of the young people who are now protesting, my personal uh, litmus test was not from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, my personal litmus test was long live the dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> and if you fail that test, if you fail that test, then you are the enemy. Now, even to this day, the notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat warms the cockles of my heart. Those parts of my heart are not suffering from heart disease, uh, warms the cockles of my heart. But I recognize there's a difference between your political ideology, your political philosophy, and coming up with the right political slogan. Okay. And I don't believe from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is the right slogan. Even if you share the goal, obviously.
Excuse me? Even if you share the goal. Yes, uh, this, okay, everybody's entitled to their own ideology, but that's not politics. Okay, got it. Uh, yes, you would. In the, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so thanks for talking about Nat Turner. Um, I was kind of maybe an idol of mine. I really appreciate him, and I wish I were friends with him. But um, I something that stuck out to me, a word that you said that stuck out to me was extract. And I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, what it means. So I'm just to give a tiny bit of context. I know we're short on time. Um, I'm originally from Ithaca, New York. Um, I know, I feel like there's kind of a Cornell vibe in this audience, so if anyone knows that place. But um, I moved to the city in June 2022, so I've been here almost a year and a half. And um, something I've been struggling with or just thinking a lot about is what it means to um, live here. And I wish, I, I'm hoping, I, I just want you to talk a little bit about what it means to live somewhere and not have an extractive relationship with that land. Okay. Actually, that question or a form of it came up in correspondence I had with a uh, Pakistani friend of mine. And he said the following to me. He said, there's no way Israel is going to ever agree to a two-state settlement that there's no way Israel is going to ever agree to anything. And so he said to me, as a practical matter, don't you think it just makes much more sense to tell the Palestinians to just go live somewhere else in the Arab world? Because if you don't tell them that, then their lives, their sojourns, their terrestrial sojourns will just be a protracted anguish and misery. And I have to say, at some rational level, what he said made sense. But then I told him, you know, if you take the United States in the early part of the 19th century, there were large numbers of whites, Lincoln among them, who support the emancipation of the slaves, but only on condition that they went to live in some place like Haiti or Africa. And then there were blacks who gave up on any possibility in the United States and formed uh, black uh, colonization societies to go live in Africa. And you could say, rationally, in a way it made sense, because first of all, there was 30 years between the 1820s, 40 years, and the Civil War, so that's 40 years of misery. Then there's the Civil War, and then you have the Jim Crow system, and that endures until 1954, so that's 130 years of anguish and misery. And maybe it would have made more sense to just do what the Jewish, or not Jewish, uh, do what the black colonization society, what Abraham Lincoln had to say, and just go elsewhere. But there were some people like the abolitionists and Frederick Douglass amongst them who said, no, we should stay here and fight for our rights. And you can say that even now, in 2023, there still remains a lot of work to be done 
before those rights are fully realized. So at the rational level, there was an argument to be made for just leaving in 1820 and putting this whole struggle behind you, at least the struggle to gain equality as a black person in the United States. However, I would be curious how many people in the room today or who are being live streamed this would say that the abolitionists, white and black, the William Lloyd Garrison's, Wendell Phillips, Charles Summers, Thaddeus Stevens, Frederick Douglass's, how many people would say they were wrong? Their advice was to stay and fight for your rights. And so many people in northern Gaza have defied Israeli orders to leave, saying we'd rather die here than leave our homes, even though they're under constant bombardment. That I, you know, there I can't really say, because I don't know. I mean, we're told that people in hospitals have said that, and then there are people who have gone south, and there was nowhere to go, because the south is being bombed, and there is no refuge, because that's not their literal home, in the sense of their residence, so they're just going back north. It's die in the south or die in the north of Gaza. Um, I'm just saying, I'm answering the question you put, or a version of the question you put. I'm answering in the same way as I answered the question about uh, what was the rational aim of the people who burst the gates of Gaza concentration camp. I don't think that those sorts of calculations using utilitarian and rational calculus, I just don't think they really speak to the nature of the moment. Okay, we're gonna take, uh, I think, one more question. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, so you said that what, what the U.S. says goes, I think that's very true. Uh, Biden, Biden stops with a phone call. Um, and, you know, what could, from the perspective of what, what we can do, which is, I'm sure, what's all on our minds, um, you know, international pressure and getting ceasefire resolution seems like the best thing we can do, I guess, um, although it may be a drop in the bucket. Um, there was a revealing exchange with Rokana, where activists went into Rokana's office, and Rokana is one of the people who said, I want to minimize civilian, civilian casualties, IDF should do better, you know, but has not signed on to ceasefire. And the activists, and Brokhan said that he would, he would support a ceasefire if he saw a pattern of international humanitarian law violations. Or, and he said that um, Israel targeting hospitals is, is such a hypothetical, you know. And my, what, I'm, what I want to say is the activists didn't really have a, a good response to him. Like, they couldn't point to um, a pattern of international humanitarian law violations, either from the current camp campaign or from past campaigns. And to, to, to get to my question, you are a forensic scholar, as you like to say, and you we need to learn the details of this stuff so we can have so we can point to a pattern of international humanitarian law violations so we can make the case. You know, how how what what can we read from you that, that and how can we shape our, our messages to congressional staff, for example, like to, to make those arguments better? Okay, so I'll just repeat for the uh, for the video audience. What is the best evidence? What is the best case to make that is to show that Israel has repeated uh, systematic violations of international law in attacking Gaza? Well, there are two things. Number one, and I don't want to be ad hominem, I have to resist the temptation. <laughs> though, some, though sometimes. I uh, forget that admonition to myself. Often. Often. <laughs> Only in private, Aaron. You have to be a moral idiot to think at this point that Israel is, if Israel's massacre in Gaza is the application 
of international humanitarian law. But, but our, no, no, Congress number, isn't really Number concerned. one, number one, on October 8th, there were three statements made by senior officials. Statement number one by Defense Minister Gallon. We're not letting in any water, fuel, food, or electricity. Full stop. Statement number two by Chaim Herzog, the president of Israel. Excuse me? Yitzhak. Herzog. Or Yitzhak Herzog. Excuse me. Uh, Yitzhak Herzog. We don't distinguish between civilians and combatants in Gaza. They're all Hamas. Statement number three by Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu. This is going to be a very long war, much longer than ever before. The longest recent war, I won't go back to 1982, the longest recent South War massacre was in July, August 2014. It lasted 51 days. So if you add those three statements up, what you have is no food, no water, no electricity, and uh, no fuel for 51 plus days to the entire population of Gaza. Now that was stated in October 8th. That is a murder plan. That is a genocide plan. And if you don't want to hear the word genocide, well, guess what? Too bad because that's what it is. It's a genocidal plan. And ever since that day, everything Israel has done has been in accordance with that genocidal plan. Israel has systematically targeted hospitals, systematically targeted ambulances, has systematically leveled the entire infrastructure of Gaza. And you still, you still can't Make up your mind whether or not what's happening in Gaza is in accordance with international humanitarian law. You're a moron. <laughs> you are a moron. A moral idiot. Now, Comrade Lenin liked the expression of moral cretin, but no. <laughs> You're a moral idiot. But then we have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge that international humanitarian law is in large parts completely lunatic itself. So let's take one example. There is this ridiculous, okay, I won't call it ridiculous. I don't want to, I don't want to prejudge my argument. There is this, there are three central principles of international humanitarian law, what's called the laws of war. One is called the principle of distinction. Everybody knows it. You can't target civilians. You can't target civilian sites like hospitals, schools, and so forth. You could only ta target uh, combatants and military sites. A, t uh, a, a tank brigade, whatever. Okay? Everybody knows that principle. Then there is a second principle. It's a principle of discrimination. You can't use weapons or methods of warfare which are unable to distinguish between civilians and combatants. For example, poison gas. The poison gas, once it spreads, it can't distinguish between civilians and combatants. So it's called an indiscriminate weapon, and it's illegal according to those basic principles of the laws of war. And then there's this third concept. It's called the concept of proportionality. And the concept of proportionality is very simple. So let's say Colin Robinson is sitting in the first row. He is a senior member of Hamas. <laughs> Okay, and he has been responsible for one terrorist bombing after another. But can you raise your hand, colleagues? People are, people are straining to see you. Okay, now the question of proportionality is as follows If Colin is a legitimate military target because he's a combatant, 
having committed and will commit in the future many heinous crimes. How many civilians are you allowed to kill in order to legitimately, according to the laws of war, take out, if you don't mind the expression, Colin, take out Colin. So that's called proportionality, that the number of civilians killed must be proportional to the value of the military target. Colin being a high value target because he's, he's a high level officer in Hamas, he's committed crimes, he will commit more crimes. And then the question is, no, it's a very serious question. I'm not, I'm not making this up at all. Can you use a weapon to take out Colin, which will kill everybody in the room? That's not a joke. That's what proportionality means. In order to eliminate Colin, can you kill everybody in the room? Look around you. Can you all be killed? Is he a legitimate target? And often, when I discuss this with students and I take the case of killing everybody in my class, uh, obviously they get very queasy about this notion of proportionality. So it's a very nebulous, it's basically an utterly ridiculous, useless concept because how can you possibly measure things like that? The value of the military target versus the number of people who are can legitimately be killed. So it's already a ridiculous concept. But then you reach that point of moral insanity. So Gaza is one of the most densely populated places on God's earth. And then it is among the most densely places on God's earth, Jabalia refugee camp is among the most densely populated places in Gaza. And then, three days ago, Israel dropped two 2,000 ton bombs on Jabalia. Okay, that to me sounds, oh, they, oh, and they claim there was a Hamas leader there and there were also the tunnels, you know, the tunnels. And then you read in the Guardian newspaper, I opened up the Guardian, and the Guardian has an expert in international humanitarian law you know, those doctors of death, the experts. And she says, it's a very tough question whether it was okay, you know, it's a very tough balancing act, this proportionality. And at that point, you just have to say, if you think that's a tough question, whether or not it's legitimate, to drop two two thousand, is it pound? Pound, 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 pound. Two two thousand pound bombs on a crowded refugee camp in which half the people killed are children. Then either the law is insane or you're insane. But I really don't want to enter into that universe. I don't even want to go there if you can't see the utter insanity of a statement like that, that it's a tough balancing question. Thank you. And you see it so far in the official numbers. So I believe from Israeli sources, the official figure that they have, according to their own calculations, they killed about 60 Hamas operatives. Let's take that at face value, assume that's true. So you have 60 Hamas operatives versus 10,000 slain Palestinian civilians overall, including more than 4,300 children. So you see if those numbers are correct. Israel has killed more children in Gaza than in every other war zone in the world, every other war zone in the world combined for the years 2020, 2021 
and 2022. In each of those years, if you take all the child deaths and combine them, Israel has killed more children in Gaza. When I mentioned that, when I mentioned that fact on a program, what is that called? The Comedy Hour? Comedy Cellar, yeah. Comedy Cellar. When I mentioned that fact, this fellow named Eli Lake, he got this very skeptical look in his face, and he said, more than in Ukraine? And it was interesting. It was interesting. Because the next day, somebody sent me the statistic. In the 20 months of the war in Ukraine, in the 20 months, 550 children had been killed in 20 months. Remember that from day one, there were claims that Russia was committing genocide in Ukraine. Joe Biden said that. Right. And after 20 months, they had killed 500 children. And when I was on that program, at that moment, in three weeks, in three weeks, Israel had killed already 3,500 Palestinian children in Gaza. And yet, People wonder whether Israel is either applying the laws of war or committing a genocide in Gaza. Okay, we're going to wrap it there. Thanks to everybody who came out. Thank you for welcome to this one. No respect to the event the first time I've been up. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, John Robinson, and Lord Bush. Thank you. Thank you.